Hi, I'm Lawrence Akers and I'm a hypnotherapist. And like many hypnotherapists out there, I believe this is possibly the best job on the planet. Now for years, I've been continuing to work on my craft. Some days I feel like I'm a really good hypnotherapist. And other days it could be a bit of a struggle, almost like I, I feel like I'm missing some piece of knowledge or some wisdom that would take my belief from self-doubt to unstoppable. And so that's what this podcast is all about. Conversations with those who do get great results and what it means to be the confident hypnotherapist. Welcome everyone today. Today we have a real treat. We are talking with Larry Garrett. Now Larry has been operating since 1968. I know he doesn't look like he has, but he certainly has. He runs the Garrett Hypnosis and Wellness Center in Chicago, which is the longest running hypnotherapy center in Chicago. Definitely one of the most respected, multiple award winning hypnotherapists in our industry, not only for his incredible work, but also for his generosity and kind spirit. Um, has a fascinating backstory. Went to Iraq to work with Sudan, uh, Sudan Hussein's son there for a while. He's written two books on that, Hypnotizing the Devil and Healing the Enemy. Uh, worked with police departments using hypnosis to aid in recall and investigative work. Has lectured, taught and demonstrated hypnosis to over 400 colleges, universities and high schools. And on his bio, although we've discussed it, and he said that this number is out of date, he has hypnotized an estimated 60,000 individuals, including many celebrities, professionals. It, just remarkable. Um, and, you know, I think, Larry, you were saying that was 20 years ago, that number. Uh, so um, how many would you say nowadays would that figure be up to, perhaps? Yeah, I wouldn't say as many more because I think, by the way, that, that sounds like an interesting bio. Sounds like an interesting guy. I'd like to know him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, what happened, Lawrence, was at that time, I go back in my 30s and 40s, you know, I may have been hypnotizing anywhere between 40 and 60 people a week. So it was easy to accumulate, as we say, 60,000. And when we moved to my present wellness center, uh, I had my office person start counting intake folders. Not how many times each client had been there, but how many that there, and she was up to almost 60,000. So that's where we got that number, but that's 20 years ago. So maybe we have 65,000 now. So. <laughs> Who counts? It's, it it is count. remarkable to say the least. And um, <laughs> I, I can't thank you enough for your time today and to talk about this topic of confidence within mm -hmm. hypnotherapists. Uh, because as I mentioned to you before we started, you know, I feel that many hypnotherapists struggle to find their confidence initially. And yet, at the same time, I also see many hypnotherapists who just yeah. embrace this and become naturally very good hypnotherapists straight away. When you think back on your early days, were you someone who always had that confidence or was that something that you learned as you went along? What was your initial experiences like? Uh, no, uh, you know, you had mentioned I started 68. Actually, that was my first class in hypnosis right. about two years later i opened my office 1970 <clears throat> excuse me so uh, i've been doing full-time hypnosis as a living for since 1970 uh so i want to share with you that no i was very insecure I, I had a high level of anxiety when i started hypnosis which is what got me in there in 1968 mm -hmm. and i had uh i had a lot of anxiety related symptoms severe ulcers bleeding ulcers i had constant cluster headaches my hands would tremor sometime, smoke too much, bit my nails, and I used to stutter. Mm -hmm. One thing is when you stutter, your confidence level drops because as you, 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 you're trying to talk, you can't. You become very inadequate inside. So I was hypnotized. My original instructor was Fred Shavel, and he taught me many things, and you're speaking about confidence. I'll share that in a moment. But I remember the first time I was hypnotized, Fred Shavel hypnotized me. And I'm sitting there with my eyes closed saying, I'm not hypnotized. I could open my eyes anytime I want. I'm sure every hypnotist has been through that one. Mm. And when I opened my eyes about 20 minutes later, I thought something was wrong because nothing was wrong. I didn't have a headache. I didn't feel nervous inside. I didn't feel anxious. So there became almost an obsessive energy that said, what is this? 
So one of the things Fred taught me, by the way, uh, most of my confidence comes after hypnosis, of course, as I just shared. But uh, my instructor, Fred Shavo, said to me, as a hypnotist, you always have to be right. That's an interesting thought, right? Mm-hmm. The client says, I don't think I was hypnotized. Yes, you were. Shut up. <laughs> you, know, like, <laughs> you don't talk like that, but that's what you think, right? But my greatest motivator, my greatest inspiration was one phrase my mother used many years ago. It was probably in my, maybe 69, my first year getting out into the hypnosis community. And we had an organization then which still exists, but under a different name, and it was called the Association to Advance Ethical Hypnosis. Have you heard of them? No, I haven't. Okay. So they were the largest hypnosis group in the country at the time, uh, and they were called the AAEH. Probably people closer to my age remember it well because they were the biggest one. There were about 700 members, which was a lot of people in 1968-69. So I went to a a meeting for the Association to Advance Ethical Hypnosis, and I'm a newbie. And I may add, I may add, Lawrence, they didn't like me. Uh, And I'll share with you why as we go on, but they didn't like me. So my confidence was always dwindling because they weren't polite or nice. Hypnosis was a different type of energy at that time. There was a lot of competition, a lot of animosity. They didn't like, they didn't come to new people and say, come on, let me teach you how to do hypnosis well. It wasn't so easy. And I was one of those new people. So my mother was also a hypnotist. When my mother saw my training I was going through, the ulcers disappeared and my headaches disappeared. I discontinued medication. I started feeling more at peace. I quit smoking. He said, and my, I, I remember at that time, I was married at the time, my wife said to my mother, you know what he's wasting his money on now? Hypnosis classes. My mother said these words. What are you going to waste your money on next? Until she saw And when she saw me evolve, she began to take classes with me. Now my mother and I are sitting at this association, the Advanced Ethical Hypnosis meeting, and there are about 100 people in this room. And I may add, Lawrence, a lot of your women viewers will love this one. There were no women in the group. Uh, at that time, there was only one other woman. There was one woman who had did not done hypnosis at that time. Right now, we have one woman here in Chicago area, a good associate of mine, Diana Barrar. Mm-hmm. Diana Barrar has been doing full-time hypnosis since 1971. She, was, she became part of that. I'll go back. My mother's sitting next to me. And I'm looking around and I'm checking these people out and you could tell I'm all I'm all excited at the same time I'm scared. My mother leaned over and she whispered, don't compete with these people you'll lose. Just mm-hmm. be the best player you Garrett you can. Good? Yep. To this day, Lawrence, if a person, if a hypnotist says to me, a hypnotherapist says, would you look at my website and see what you think? For sure, I'd be glad to. However, I choose not to go on other hypnotists' website because I don't want to be influenced of saying, oh, they're doing better than me. Oh, they're doing terrible. There's no judgment in my mind. Obviously, if I went to Iraq and I spent 60 hours with one of the most hated people in the world, you can imagine I don't judge too well. Otherwise, I wouldn't have come home. Mm. So I have learned to minimize my judgment. I have learned not to compete with other hypnotists because it doesn't matter what they're doing. You know, visualize two runners. They're running down the track. And this guy's in the front, and here comes this guy catching up. This guy gets discouraged and starts dropping back. Mm. That's the way I look at competition and hypnosis. It's fascinating you say that because I know speaking to people that quite often what throws people out is when they see other hypnotherapists, uh, uh, good if I could talk, other hypnotherapists posting on Facebook saying, I'm so busy at the moment. I've got, you know, yeah. 100 clients this week or whatever it is and yes. there's that part of them that comes up saying well why am i not that busy what yes. am i doing wrong yes. so it's funny yes. you say that because you know even i've experienced that at times where you see that but i also tend to wonder is it that gung-ho belief that they have that's getting results with the clients as well it's an interesting thing i think two things lawrence i think one thing is we don't need to brag when we're successful mm. right The other issue is, I I think of a phrase that I really love a lot. It's not arrogance when it's true. Mm. So both of those are a little contradicting. However, Mm. 
let me tell you how many clients I see. You know, like I almost get embarrassed with that number on my bio. But that was the number when, you know, when we were moving. Uh, if I were to tell you who I am and clients I see, you'd say, that Larry Garrett, he's an egotistical maniac. So instead, I'm just going to tell you, I enjoy what I do. Yeah. I love what I do. I've been earning a very good living since 1970. Do I see 80 clients a week? That's not the issue. Mm. I just spoke to a good friend of mine who's a very, very successful man. And he says, you know, it's not about having enough money. It's about enjoying life and feel, feeling free. That's yeah. what I like about my profession. Absolutely agree don't, with that. I'm going to tell your viewers, I can tell your viewers and your listeners, don't pay too much attention to what other people are doing. Just be the best that you can. And if you're the best you can, you know what? You're going to do well. Mm -hmm. so you, you, nobody can be a better Larry Garrett than me, Lawrence. <laughs> well, that's my grandson, I, Larry Garrett. <laughs> I think even when people are learning uh, hypnotherapy, for the first time, quite often what they find is that they start to emulate uh, the people that they were trained by and, and not finding right. who they uniquely are as well. Yeah, and what, what right. kind of things do you think people can do to help discover who they uniquely are as a hypnotherapist? Um, well, good wording. And I have to be okay, it's good to emulate your instructor. Mm -hmm. It's also not good to emulate your instructor if your instructor mm -hmm. happens to be a person that's not congruent with the well-being of hypnosis. So I'm going to say, inside of all of us, there's a magical energy of some sort. Mm -hmm. And there's a great podcast that I've uh, viewed in the past called A Rumor of Empathy. And there's one statement in here he makes, his name is Lou Gustafson. And he says, empathy is oxygen for the soul. And that really touched me. So I, I have to say these words, no disrespect to any instructors, you know, whether it be somebody here in the States, somebody by you in Australia. I'm just going to say these words. Learn who you are. Refrain from trying to be like your instructor. Because in some ways, I think we're almost competing if we want to be. I want to be just like my instructor. That sounds to me like a little competition there, mm -hmm. but don't call it that because I really believe we're missing something. And if we could understand our consciousness and we could have empathy. Do you know, uh, uh, Lawrence, I don't know if you know this, but this isn't bragging, just making a profound statement. Mm -hmm. in, in October, it'll be 50 years I'm doing hypnosis. Doesn't mean I know everything. We'll figure that later. But however, I'm going to say to you, I've never advertised. Mm -hmm. I've never asked a client to come back. I've never solicited a client. All I do is I sit with my client and for that short amount of time, I think I wrote that in my uh, manual I sent you on pre-talk. Mm. They are the only person in the whole world for that amount of time. Yeah. And, and that's kept me in business for many years. It's a very um, person-centered attitude there as well, isn't it? Just to create that space where... It could be open for that person to be able to express whatever it is they need to express and for you to be there and hear it. Yes, yes. You mentioned yes. before that when you were learning, uh, you know, Frank was the instructor and your mother also gave you some wisdom there as well. Were sure. there any other people that were involved in, in providing you with insight and wisdom? You know, who, what did you take away from those people? Yes. <laughs> Very good. My mind's clicking away. First off, my mother gave me many, you know, I remember my mother saying to me, I was at that time, I was still employed, moving into more hypnosis. And my mother said, if you love hypnosis so much, you need to quit your job and do it full time. Mm -hmm. Ooh, this is 1970. <laughs> I have a family at the time, not making much money. However, my mother had her own business in the 40s. So you can imagine Smoxy single mom telling me, quit my job. Mm. That's how much she believed in me. But I will go back to another statement that I felt was really good. And I, w I used to do hypnosis shows for 15, 18 years, did many hypnosis shows because that's how I was able to earn enough money to stay in business, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't so much my love. By the way, there was only three stage hypnotists 
roaming around the country at that time. Can you imagine three Lawrence right now? We must have 3,000, right? Mm. So, Very popular in the U.S. especially, yes. Yes, it is. It is. So at that time, there were only three, and I had a booking agent that would book me continually. And I was going to this local college in Illinois, and I, I remember it well like it was yesterday. This has to be 40 years ago. I'm driving there. It's about four hours from Chicago. And I get there, and, and when I get there, I, I, give, I give the guy, I says, here, this is, this is my information. This is my bio. And he looks at it, and he says, I'm not going to read that. He says, you get up there, and you just tell them what you know. I never gave somebody a bio again. I just said, he's right. So there was another piece of information. You know, it's like, blah, 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 and he did this, and he did that, and he did you know, just like you read a nice bio of mine. Thank you. It's on my website. I think clients need to read that you know what you're doing. Yeah. But I don't think I need a bio because that guy taught me many years ago. It doesn't matter what this bio says. Tell them what you know. Hmm. And so that was another piece of confidence. Uh, also, another piece, this was good. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know if you know this part or not, if it was in my bio, but uh, I had one of the very first classes on hypnosis in a local college in Illinois, maybe in the country, I don't know. 1973, uh, I was taking a class on photography at a local college called Morton College. And a young woman in the class said, you know, we talked about hypnosis, I would talk to everybody about hypnosis. And she said to me, uh, why don't you go to the college and tell them you do hypnosis, maybe they'll do a class for you. Okay. I go to talk to the dean. Well, you know, he says, this is kind of a conservative community. You know, remember 1973 is different than now. And he says, and I don't know if the community would go for it. I, so at that time, I was going to be on a TV program. Of all programs, Lawrence, here I am doing hypnosis, but a program called News of the Psychic World. Right. So, right, right, you see? So I say to the dean, oh, well, I'm going to be on TV this Sunday. Maybe you could watch it and give you an idea who I am. Don't mind Jack. He's barking about the fireworks. Right That's now. okay. My cat was meowing in the background for yeah, us. They, so. they don't like the fireworks. Mm. So uh, I, he called me the following Monday, Morton College. And he says, can you come in? I said, yeah. So he says, I have to apologize, Larry. He says, I never saw your program. He says, but my wife did, and she loves you, so you've got the job. So 29 years, I taught classes at Wright College and Morton College in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a long-running class, a very successful class, and the first of its kind. I remember, again, hypnosis was very primitive in the 70s. Mm -hmm. There were no new books. There was no people to ask, help me. And uh, so we had to just go by, our, by the seat of our pants. When you, when you do teach uh particular classes, what is it that you're looking for in students that might indicate that they're going to go and become great hit therapists? Well, my initiation was not to teach people to be hypnotists, although that became part of my career as we went on. Remember at that time, Lawrence, I did anything I can to make a living, mm. whatever it took, but it had to be hypnosis. So my initial classes were to teach people about the subconscious mind and self-hypnosis and what hypnotherapy is about. So some of them, like Diana Barrar, she was in my earlier classes, they went on to be hypnotherapists, but most of these people would take these classes to improve themselves. Mm. And, many, and many people would take these classes to, uh, to improve themselves in order to be hypnotherapists. Then for a while, going back to maybe about 1974, 75, I started teaching other people to be hypnotherapists. However, I'm a very sensitive man. You know, I, I'm emotional, I'm sensitive. And at that time, I was pretty neurotic. And I would teach people hypnosis, and I'd say, this is an ethical way, this is an appropriate way. And they would go off and do their own way. And it would really upset me that they didn't do what I wanted them to do. <laughs> so I found out I had no control anyway, so, mm. I might as well forget. so I stopped teaching them. Not, not the course at the college, but I stopped teaching people to be hypnotherapists. Mm. So you, you kind of touched on this uh, in a few of your responses so far, but if a hypnotherapist was to come to you and say that they just weren't seemingly getting the results they wanted with the clients that they had, 
what advice would you give to them? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, Lawrence has, I have many hypnotherapists and when they travel and they stop in Chicago, I always say, stop and visit with me. Come and visit with me. I recently had somebody from Germany come and visit me. Do you know Norbert Fries? No, I don't. Norbert know Fries. Mm. Yeah. He's a wonderful man. We spent 10 days together. He came to Chicago. I have a little apartment upstairs. When somebody comes from out of town, I usually shove him up there. So when a person, when a hypnotherapist comes to me for advice, I usually listen to them like I would a client. Mm. So what are you doing right now? How is it working? Uh, in the 1980s, we had a financial crush. And this challenge we had, interest rates and home buying was 18%. Things were not easy. Our business became stronger during that time. Uh, it, I, had a, I had a woman work in my front desk who used to collect coupons. And she'd say, maybe we should give them coupons. I said, you can't give a client a coupon. That'd be like your doctor saying, here's a, here's a, here's a coupon and the next time you come in, you get $10 off. Mm -hmm. So we set it up differently and I still use the system to this day. When a client comes in, I do give them a little card that says, thank you for using our services, blah, blah, blah. And if you refer somebody to us, the next time you come in, we will give you $25 off and we will give the person you referred $20, $25 off. So if you look at three coupons, Lawrence, those three will create three each. That's nine. Those nine will create uh, 27. Those 27 mm -hmm. will create 78 or 81. So all of a sudden, you have a lot of clients. We've been doing that since 1983. So that's one thing, you know. You asked me, what would I say to a client or a hypnotherapist? So I'm going to say not to skirt that answer. Mm -hmm. I would listen to what they're doing. So I always use this philosophy. I listen to what a person tells me, but I hear what they're not saying. Mm -hmm. And that's how I would teach a hypnotherapist to be successful. I really believe, Lawrence, I, I don't know who you are, and I'm not going to judge anybody, but I really believe that most hypnotherapists, their humanness gets in the way sometimes. Yeah. One thing is they might count heads. Oh, I only had three clients this week. I had eight last week. Something must be wrong. Whoa. Oh, stop counting. When we count, we always know what we don't have. Mm. Don't we? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I, I always say, uh, if it goes quiet for a week, I, I say it's the universe telling me I need to slow down for a moment and just that's listen right. to what that says. It's like, I'll know it ramp up again. I yeah. just need to accept that this is the week I have and maybe to do yeah, something different. Sure. Even money, even money, Lawrence. I, you know, I'm kind of a philosophical type of individual and, and the left hemisphere doesn't come into play too much. Mm -hmm. I always joke and say I'm a Pisces, you know, and they're all emotional. And the logical side's not there often. So I don't count clients. I don't count dollars. I don't count things that will impact my emotions. Mm -hmm. So if I need $500 and I only have $200, I've got stress. Yep. But you just made a good statement. I'm going to add to it. But if I trust... Ooh, just trust. I'll always have enough. Mm. And of course, the person who has no clients and has little money, is, how could you trust? Another great philosophy I remember my mother teaching me once. I'm so sorry about Jack, but I can't it's shut okay. him up. No, dogs will uh, be my mother, dogs. My mother taught me a great phrase one day. I was real broke. By the way, four times in my career, Lawrence, I've been totally zero and less. And he, one day I was really upset. I said, oh, I'm really in trouble. I have no money, no clients. I'm not making anything. And she sat back real calm and she said, don't worry about it. Because if you don't worry about it, then there's nothing to worry about. I was so angry once. I said, oh, yeah, you could say that. You have money in the bank. I'm broke. I have nothing. And calmly she said, and if you don't worry about it, there's nothing to worry about. Mm. I didn't catch it until much later. Now I understand what she was attempting to tell me. Emotions of worry challenge you. And isn't it interesting too, Lawrence, we say this one. Somebody will say, aren't you worried? You say, no, I'm not worried. What, don't you care? Now where did we get this irrational assumption that worry Sorry, means equals you care? care? Yeah. 
no no logic to it. Mm. Worrying and caring are two different issues. I care. I really care. I love my clients. I love what I do. I've never gotten tired of sitting or hypnotizing clients. Never. No, I just don't. I just don't think I'll do it till I take my last breath at 100 years old. I plan on living to be 100 plus, mm-hmm. and I think I'll do that by maintaining this philosophy. Do you know the work by Wayne Dyer? Yes. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Good. I've been a great follower of his for years. One thing he said: we become what we think about all day long. Mm. Today is a coming attraction of tomorrow. Both of those statements. They just keep thinking it's okay. It's mm. okay. I woke up this morning. What a wonderful gift I got. I woke up. Rest is up to me. That's, even that statement's full of, of gratitude, just to be able to get up and experience something new each day oh, yeah. and to create what we want in that moment. Yeah, I have such gratitude of life, Lawrence. Such mm. gratitude. I love life. So by all means, I'll keep going. I could ramble if you notice. I could ramble and ramble. The, the, the funny thing wow. is that you have this amazing ability to uh, almost pre-answer the question that I had set up following, which is wonderful in some ways. Um, but, you know, you, you mentioned on your website that quote, I may not know everything, but after many years of full-time practice, I've been around the yes. blocks a few times. Yes. And, you know, the question I've got here is after a career as established as yours, with as many achievements that you've had, and what does the future have in store for you? And what keeps you motivated to do a few more rounds of the block? So, so saying it quite a little different about my, about going around the block, that last part. Oh, did you want to repeat it or? It's that last part about going around the block because yeah, I use that phrase often. Mm. Do you live in the city? I do. Yes. Okay. So I live in Chicago proper. Mm-hmm. My office, by the way, is one block away from me. So living in a city, having a dog, I walk around the block a lot. And as a metaphor and true, we walk around the block and we go, oh, I never saw that building before. Well, it's been there for 100 years. Where were you? So every time we go around the block, we some, see something new, something mm-hmm. different. And I, you know, I don't know about you, Lawrence. I know that you're, I can feel your love for hypnotherapy, but I'm going to say every time I sit with a client, I learn something new. And collectively, I put it in my bio computer. I often say the subconscious mind's like your hard drive. Conscious mind's like the screen of your computer. But a conscious mind might have one message that says, I know I'm okay, but I feel like I'm not. I know I look good, but I feel ugly. So I look at that and I attempt to use my subconscious mind to listen to clients. And I always learn something new. Mm. That's going around the block. Going back to that idea of when people come to you to ask for advice, in terms of people's continued professional development and continue to learn, because learning is a wonderful thing. Uh, it helps us to remain curious, yeah. but I also tend to wonder about the motivation behind some people's desire to learn. Is it about hoping that they come across, you know, a trainee that's going to be a magic bullet for them? Mm-hmm. What advice do you give to people in terms of how they decide what kind of additional training or learning they might need? You're talking about training as a client wanting to improve their life? More as, training a, as, a, a as a hypnotherapist, yeah. Okay. So, if if the average hypnotherapist could learn two skills, stay in the moment and love yourself unconditionally, Hmm. then what happens with those two moments is they're not thinking about the last client they saw that maybe they didn't do so well with, and they're not thinking about the next client they're going to see after this one. They're present with this client, one. Hmm. That's staying in the moment. I learned a skill many years ago, late 70s, early 80s, to love myself unconditionally. If we love ourselves unconditionally, we refrain from self-judgments. If we refrain from self-judgments, then we don't sit there with a client wondering, I hope I'm saying the right thing. I hope I'm listening to them well. And 
So those two phrases, I think, Lawrence, are real strong for the average hypnotherapist. Nothing else. I mean, they could know. See, I think hypnosis is a wonderful profession for the person who doesn't necessarily work a lot with their structured or logical mind because it's so creative, isn't it? And I think about hypnotherapy as being an art. Some people like watercolors, some people like pastels, some people like oil colors, and they're all artists. So there is no right or wrong with hypnosis as long as we have integrity, we stay in a moment, we accept ourselves unconditionally, and we listen to that client. Then our success is there. You know, a, a good artist, a good musician, a good writer, a good poet, they don't judge your words. You know, the, you know I, I've written about 200 articles published with uh, the NGH and others, and I'm criticized sometime, and I'm judged sometime. But it's not for me to listen to their criticism as though I'm inadequate. I listen to their criticism as a way of improving. So I, I think the idea of hypnotherapists is to accept who you are unconditionally. It's interesting you mentioned there about being able to be free of distraction. You know, what, what advice do you have for people in terms of if they do find themselves getting in their own head during sessions, being distracted by their own thoughts, that competitiveness that you were talking about earlier, what would you say to them to help them to be able to so let go of that thought in a moment? Yeah. Yeah. As I listen to your hedge trimmer, mm. I need to share with you, it doesn't distract me at all because it's your hedge trimmer distracting you. Mm. As Jack was barking, it distracted me because it's my distraction. When I work with a client, <laughs> see, there he goes again. When I work Timing. with a client, <laughs> well, when I work with a client, I attempt to be as present as I can. Mm -hmm. Much like I'm looking at you right now. I don't want to look around. I don't want to check the ceiling out. I, I want to focus on them, mm -hmm. just them, on their breathing, on one eyebrow going up, coloring in their face changing, shifting their gaze as they look around, adjusting in their chair as they change a the subject. Not just body language, not just NLP, but intuitive reading of who this person is, then we are not distracted. Mm. So we're distracted when we get into our own ego. We're distracted when we get into, are we doing the right thing? But if I am with this client, I'm not distracted. Um, have you ever heard the book, Kinship with All Life? No, I haven't. Okay. Kinship with All Life is a book that was written in the late 50s. It was written by a movie writer who, um, who uh, had the opportunity of dog sitting for a very famous dog called Rin Tin Tin. And Rin Tin Tin was a famous dog in the 50s and 60s that would rescue everybody and whatever else. So his friends owned Rin Tin Tin. They were going on a travel trip for six months and asked what he watched the dog. And he said, okay, so the dog is delivered to him in a limo. And he said, I've never had a dog before. Should I take care of this dog like a celebrity or like a dog? He said, I'll let the dog teach me. And that starts the book. And from that, on, from that point on, he speaks about different animals, different living things. That doubled my counseling skills, doubled. And the reason it doubled it, I learned a language that's called intent. And the language of intent is is used by every living thing, including an insect crawling on the ground, including a bee flying around. And if we're scared, that bee is going to sting us. And then if you think about the word intent used in life, they say, oh, I'm going to purchase this home and we'll hang the picture there. We'll put the TV there. We're going to put the couch there. That's called intent to purchase. Somehow you're going to acquire that loan with intent. And uh, that's the way I feel that we need to be with every client. We need to hear their intent. Mm -hmm. That's great. I actually really love that. That speaks to me quite strongly. Thank you. Um, 
So I guess, you know, what I'm hearing from my conversation with you is that really one of the biggest things in order to tap into that confidence is to be able to, um, to stop the competition or comparing that goes on within our own heads whenever we are, you know, either in front of a client or looking at our business or looking at our own place within the industry. Um, And I think that that's a really fascinating one that hopefully people watching this or listening to this amongst the hedge trimming um, will potentially take away because I know that for many people, myself included, we will get sucked back into that comparison inevitably. That's that's judgment again coming in. Judgment really is obviously comparing others to ourselves or yes. Yes. and can we that, stop it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, so how do we stop it? How do we stop it, Lawrence? How do we stop the self judgment that says, Am I good enough? What I've personally done in the past is to uh, just to remind myself firstly that I'm not in competition with people. Okay. to be able to just stop and go, I, I'm just being me and to bring me mm. to that session to help the other person. Mm. I think the other thing I've done in the past is um, to bring a sense of playfulness and curiosity into my work. Because mm. I think when it starts to feel more like play, you can allow yourself to be a little bit more creative and present to what's there. I think, Lawrence, I think, I think that language is very important in hypnotherapy. Mm. I hear these statements from hypnotherapists. Okay, well, let's see what we could do here. Ooh, that doesn't sound very confident, does it? Mm. Let's see what we could do here. Well, let's see if we could get you to quit smoking. Ooh, mm. that doesn't sound so good. Even the language of the word problem I have changed in my vocabulary. So I don't have problem in my vocabulary anymore. I might have issue, I might have challenges, but I don't have problem because that's a strong word. The next, the next statement I might hear from hypnotist is, yeah, I hypnotized my clients to quit smoking. No, no, you didn't hypnotize them to quit smoking. You hypnotized them not to need to have the cigarette. They chose to quit smoking. You just hypnotize it. And if we change that language, we'll have less failure, more success. So if I say, okay, you might even notice that on my, uh, my video introduction on my website. I say, I can't hypnotize you to quit smoking or lose weight. Did I say that on that video? Something like that? Y- yes, I think you did. Yeah. yeah. But I could hypnotize you not to eat inappropriately to your needs, or I could hypnotize you to learn how to not crave cigarettes, then you choose to quit smoking. Mm. The reason I find that so strong in my belief is that when we say to a person, I'm going to hypnotize you to quit smoking, that throws, it throws the responsibility off the client and implies you have some kind of magical powers. And, and that's not a judgment to other hypnotists. You asked me a question earlier, how could you be more successful? Hmm. Choose your language. Choose your language so you speak only with a positive, indirect type of language during your pre-talk that teaches your client, not hypnotizes your client, but teaches them how to feel. Hmm. So I say to a smoker like this one, I, by the way, I have some great articles. I have a manual on smoking if you'd like it, Lawrence. Or yeah, it'd be fantastic. Words. Did I send it to you? No, no. No, but I have a 50-page 50, 50 manual on smoking. See, smoking is one of my most successful because I used to smoke. Mm. So when we've done it, we know how to do it, you see. And if you've never smoked cigarettes, not quite. You know, like, you know, you hear the hypnotist, and the cigarettes will be terrible, and you'll be healthier if you don't smoke. Well, no kidding. I mm. know that. But the subconscious mind has a whole different language. Yep. It, says, it says, I think I'll relax and have a cigarette. And then when we think about language, how can we alter the language so the subconscious mind hears it without a threat? Mm. I have a phrase and I've written an article on, if hypnosis is so good, how come it doesn't work all the time? Because of resistance. Mm. I say to you right now, I say to you, this is a client. I say, Lawrence, don't think of an elephant. Of course, I'm gonna think of an elephant. Yeah. Think of an elephant. 
tobacco, you won't smoke anymore. Wrong language. Mm -hmm. uh, don't eat so much. Wrong language. So we need to refrain from telling a person not to do it and use a language like this. You want to see how fast we get you to, by the way, I might make it more important. I'll say, Lawrence is worth 50,000 American dollars to stop thinking of elephants. Don't think of any <laughs> elephants. Because they get out of, right? The more important it gets, the more difficult it becomes. Mm. But watch how fast that elephant disappears, Lawrence. Remember we spoke about judgment. Yep. If I say to you, Lawrence, it's okay. If you want to think of elephants, you go ahead. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you don't need to think of elephants because I've given you permission to smoke that cigarette, mm -hmm. permission to eat those cookies. You can smoke all the cigarettes you want, but if you notice and you're motivated, the urges and cravings will diminish. Here's a powerful phrase for hypnotherapists to use when they're through with their client. The client's all finished. Have you ever done stage hypnosis, Lawrence? No, I haven't. Okay. No. You know, waking suggestions, right? Mm hmm Okay. So we're all through being hypnotized. The client's sitting there with their eyes closed, and you say, okay, I count of five, open your eyes, and you reach five, and they open their eyes. They kind of have that glassy look, you know. And at that moment, you say, you notice you don't have an urge to smoke a cigarette. Or not don't. Excuse the wording, don't. Notice you are free from those urges right now. At that moment, that client does not have an urge. And at that moment, that client feels that success. So I think, I think on the video on my, um, the video on my, on my website, I think I say that I would like you, when you come to see me, think of what you would like to feel when you leave my office so you know we're successful. Did I say that? Yes, yeah. I've watched that video a long time, so I'm asking, did I say it? <laughs> so, so I say to them, what do you want to feel when you walk out the door so you know I've assisted you? What do you think that client wants to feel, Lawrence? Free from their issue, I imagine, or feeling something, a shift, yeah. something different. Something free, mm. something released. How do you feel, Lawrence, when you open your eyes after you've been hypnotized? Peaceful, I think is the word that comes to mind. Notice it'd be difficult to have a negative thought at this moment. Mm. Notice you feel a feeling of freedom at this moment. Mm. Notice the energy at this moment is a feeling of being free of this habit. So whatever you choose for your language, as long as it's positive, ask them, what do you want to feel when we're finished so you know I've assisted you? I try to get that light out of the picture. Mm. So... They will tell you. They know, don't they? I have found that phrase, that question to be most successful because they told me what they want to feel. Now, you think about this, Lawrence. Think about, and the viewers, think about anything, anything that a client would come to see you for and visualize the angst of that challenge is diminished when they've been hypnotized. You think? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So... Try that, the next client you see. What do you want to feel when you open your eyes so you know I've assisted you? They'll tell you, they know. That's, that's a, a powerful question hopefully everyone takes away and does as the next exercise or the next thing to do. Um, I, I, my hour is almost, I want to thank you so much for your yeah. time today, um, yeah. especially since it's, it's uh, late over in your part of the world. Um, Thank you enormously. And I hope everyone that's been watching this uh, goes and checks out your website and, and drops Thank you a you. line and says hello or something like that to show their appreciation of the work that you've done. We've had fun, Lawrence. We've had fun. I am honored that you requested we share some time together. Thank you so much. And, and uh, you know, as I've said online, on Facebook, wherever else, if uh, some of the hypnotherapists have some issues, some questions, write to me. And, uh, and we'll take care of it. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank I'm, you. I'm honored that you said yes to my request. So thank you very much. It's been an absolute treat to chat with you. We'll connect again. Be well. We will. Excellent.